will replace Brigitte Svenden, who is retiring after 12 years tenure. Minnesota Opera has announced. <laughs> <laughs> Take two. On the Dallas Opera Network, you're listening to Opera Box Score. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! Wherever you are, however you're listening, it's America's talk radio show about opera. It's Opera Box Score. I'm your host, Weston Williams, joined by Oliver Camacho, Matt Cummings, and Ashley Hardgrave. All right, this week, a heroic coloratura soprano is inducted posthumously into the Hall of Fame. Sorry, Gruberova fans, we thought we had so much time left with this legendary artist. Plus, in the two-minute drill, while the drill took a break for Halloween Spooktacular, both Operalia and a trade news palooza happened nonetheless. If you're watching on the Dallas Opera Network, subscribe to our podcast or on Stitcher or just favorite our show on Apple Podcasts, and that way you can hear the entire show. And uh, without further ado, Ashley, how's yes. it going? I'm going to start with you because I feel like you always have sports. I, You know I do. As, the, as your lone lady on your panel, come to me for your sports <laughs> updates. Uh, let's see. No, gender stereotypes are wrong. Forget those. Uh, so it is really tough to be a sports fan in Chicago right now. The Bears are an absolute mess. They lost again despite Justin Fields getting 100 yards in. Uh, the Hawks are winless and they were just fined $2 million in a, uh, a sexual harassment scandal that is really going off the rails. Um, the Bulls are okay for now, but Patrick Williams is now out for the season, probably, with a wrist injury, and the season just started. Uh, so it's uh, it's tough to be a sports fan in Chicago this week. For a second, I was like, ooh, that guy from the Phantom of the Opera movie? But no, that's <laughs> Patrick Wilson. I just that can't get a... Phantom off my brain ever Matt since Matt Cummings never story. not on brand. Uh <laughs> Uh, how about you, Oliver? Did you uh, do anything sports related or spooky related over the past week? Um, I did see a little bit of the uh, U.S. Figure Skating Championship, and I guess it was Le- Leesburg or something. And uh, yeah, I just want Nathan Chen to show up this year at the Olympics. I know what happened last what was four years ago, right? It seemed like yeah. yesterday when we were like, "Oh, he's going to win everything," like Simone Biles in the uh, in didn't the... land the quad. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, for men's figure skating and women's at this point, they've all got to have quads to even think about being on the podium, which is yeah. depressing if you think about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't have quads, so I could never be up there, which is sad because it's always been my dream to be out there on the ice, spinning, <laughs> jumping, A leaping. regular Michelle Trachtenberg we have. <laughs> <laughs> well, rest assured, you know, the quad is the only thing stopping you from being out there. So never give up, Weston. <laughs> this is a true story. The one and only time I've been ice skating, I had to have five people hold me up to t- take me off the ice. So I, th- I think uh, my Olympic dreams might have been uh, that was what you were telling, a little right? premature. Well, just, oh, yeah, just absolutely. Get Kim Cattrall <laughs> to be your coach and anything's possible as long as you're a physicist in college. <laughs> and that's the last reference I make to the Michelle Trachtenberg movie Ice Princess tonight, I promise. <laughs> Don't let's that. talk. I lied. Let's talk some opera. And now, ladies and gentlemen, this is OBS Hall of Famer. Our enthusiastic yet humble salute to a distinguished opera artist who has gone above and beyond to contribute greatly, distinctively, and with grand significance to the art and honor of opera. At the beginning of recording Opera Box Score two weeks ago, we had just learned that Edita Gruberova passed away at the age of 74. At the time, we did not know how she died, but uh, later news revealed that she had fallen in her home and she had a head injury. A head injury. Mm-hmm. So um, pretty tragic. And we know that she was supposed to do this uh, recital tour uh, in 2020, but then... COVID prevented that from happening and it forced her into early retirement, even though she was going to retire. It was it was imminent, but right, right. Um, yeah, this just it it stopped her career just as it was winding down in a more celebratory way. And it's really heartbreaking. And we're gonna listen to uh some recordings and talk about what made her great and what made her such a unique artist. But I wanna say just to start that. Edita Gruberova's voice is one of those voices that is really polarizing. 
Uh, some mm. people really just don't like the sound of it. Uh, it's steely where you want warmth. And uh, it really cuts like a razor. I mean, there's not a lot of um, vibrato in the sound, per se. It's very exact. And it really is one of those voices that just kind of like enters your ear like a needle, you know. And I'm crazy about that. And, you know, I've been listening to her. She's been singing forever. I've been listening to her literally my whole life as an opera fan. And trying to play recordings for my friends, like, oh, you got to hear this. And just they're like, what? No, Ugh, you know. So I just learned to live with like the shame of being <laughs> a Gubarova fan and have these recordings for myself and just listen to them alone. And now with the age of the Internet, I find that there are so many people who feel exactly the same way as I do. And oh, if, I yeah. would have just, if I would have just moved to Germany when I was a 16-year-old gay, <laughs> I would be uh, in the community of people who really, really love this instrument, this singer. She didn't sing so much in the U.S. And uh, you know, we'll talk about her career, but uh, it's our loss. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Matt to begin this tribute. Yep. Thanks, Oliver. I count myself also as a group of a stan if you can't tell from this segment that we're about to go through uh you you know it now at least <laughs> i'm looking uh, at the at the uh outline right now and i am intimidated it is substantial it's 28 well, how pages else long are you gonna, how else are you gonna cover someone who sang for literally 50 years and that's just professionally she sang before that too uh, so there's there's a couple stories about the life and career of Adita Grubarova that really like stick out to me just as touchstones for her career, her life as a singer. Uh, and I think that they're really interesting, and I think that they're more interesting than just like a list of where she sang, which, spoiler alert, is like everywhere and everything. Um, but how she first made it big and started becoming a professional singer to begin with, and she is... Born in 1946 in Bratislava, uh, which at that point was part of communist Czechoslovakia. Uh, she was born to a father who had been jailed for being non-communist for, for his political beliefs. This was like not an untumultuous childhood. Um, <laughs> but where she really made her, her path to her career is she would sing at church all the time. And there was a priest there who thought that she was so incredible, rightfully so, that she just had to join the conservatory so he helped train her he played for her recordings in order to get in they he taught her piano so that she could pass the entrance exams uh and just the idea that you would get one foot in the door from your opera career from your church job is literally every singer's <laughs> dream and i don't that think it has dream. ever happened to anyone else <laughs> if you go on yeah. the if you go on the singers forum on facebook there's always these people trying to move to chicago it's like is there a place for soprano in chicago anybody know any church jobs like oh gosh <laughs> 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 But uh, she makes it through the conservatoire. She makes her opera debut in Bratislava at age 22 in 1968. And the next year, she successfully auditioned to join the Vienna State Opera. Uh, as you may uh, not recall, Weston, but you might, Oliver, that was part of the Cold War. <laughs> <laughs> so being able to go back and forth between the Czechoslovakian and Austrian borders got more and more difficult. Uh, and it was really because she was able to successfully audition at Vienna singing what else? Queen of the Night. Um, that she got hot. She got offered a contract right there on the spot and eventually was able to defect to the West as things like got worse and worse. Uh, and this this makes it into many of her biographical write ups. But there's also this incredible documentary on YouTube called The Art of Bel Canto that everyone should watch. Uh, that's about her. It's like 54 minutes. It's in it's in German. And she tells the story about how she's like extremely pregnant with her mother who can barely walk uh, with the two suitcases, like just going to Vienna and uh, defecting. And it, it's a pretty incredible story. Uh, and yeah. I think it just shows the the gumption that this woman had in order to really make this career work. Uh, especially when you look at all of the roles that she sang through her career. It was, it's over 60 roles, uh, and it's not just the German coloratura, Mozart, and Strauss roles that you would expect to get done in German houses in Vienna, but also she sang a ton of Italian rep. She sang Gilda, she sang Violetta, she sang Bel Canto, music galore, and she 
was part of the reason why these like middle European countries that didn't really have a huge affinity for that kind of Italian music. And I kind of missed the first bel canto revival with Callis and Sills and Sutherland. Um, they, they did these operas for Grubarova because she was their star. She was their treasure. And uh, it, it's like, that's kind of an, un, an, an overlooked part of her career. Right. Um, uh, it's the Slovakian Nightingale. Some of those iconic roles I talked about already, like Queen of the Night, was like that was how she made her debut. That was how many, many people, m- many audiences came to find her. Uh, and she also sang Constanza in Abduction from the Seraglio in, in Munich. She sang a lot in Munich. But she was able to just do this crazy, hard as ridiculousness Mozart re- and Strauss <laughs> repertoire. Range had no problem for her, uh, Coloratura had no problem for her. Um, and it's a really interesting voice, like Oliver was talking about earlier. I think it's like very bell-like and silvery at its core, almost like a Lucia Pop or a Gundula Janowitz. But she has a lot more ability to like modulate her actual tone than either of them. Yeah, so I like to yeah. think of it as like if Janowitz had Beverly Sills's coloratura technique and Joan Sutherland's consistency of tone, it might have sounded a little bit like Edita Gruborova. Um, <laughs> and it's it's very instrumental in a in a way that that Mozart and Strauss requires you to be and the like the obvious joy that she gets from playing with her overtones as she shifts her sound through all of these different lines like I feel like I can hear the smile on her face uh as as she winds her way through all of these like re- crazy lines of jagged coloratura <laughs> Uh, the pitch well, I know. Is I all... know you're going to comment on this later on, but I just don't want to lose track of that Bel Canto documentary, the German documentary, mm-hmm. and like that was filmed probably when she was like already in her 60s or something. Yeah, it's from like and, 15 years ago. Yeah, so she was, or so so she was in her late 50s or early 60s, and she still had you know so much voice, uh, and she yeah. really took care of her voice and decided that she was going to stop singing certain repertoire and just focus on bel canto and you know she would do things even in that video at the age of whatever she was 60 years old 60, she would do things, yeah 62 yeah, do things that nobody does and she would smile and she would laugh a little bit it's like you know i'm just getting started you know <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, and that comes from this total and absolute control that she has over her phrasing, like, regardless of the repertoire that she's singing. She's able to sing any pitch at any dynamic, coming from any pitch at any dynamic. Like, leaps are nothing to her. Uh, Runs are nothing to her. Decrescendos on high cues are nothing to her. Um, And (laughs) part of how... (laughs) She navigates those is through her this like very generous use of portamento through her singing, which some people would call um, sliding, sliding or swooping yeah. or swooping. I like to think of it as line. Um, well, here's the thing, really quickly. You don't hear it as a proper portamento because her voice doesn't have that much vibrato. If she yeah. had more vibrato, it would sound like portamento. But because vibrato is so narrow, it does sound like sliding. I'll give people that. And... If on top of all of this, you throw in like a dash of like absolutely bizarre and campy stylistic choices that you just have to accept because they're so <laughs> idiosyncratically that's her. My favorite like thing. that's um, that's Gruberova in a nutshell. Um, she made so many recordings. The list of record of her recordings on Wikipedia is like three pages long. If you would print it out, it includes three Ariannes of Naxos, three uh, abductions from the Seraglio, a Hansel and Gretel where she plays the Dew Fairy, another one where she's Gretel, uh, three different magic flutes, three <laughs> Lucia's de Lammermoor. Like it just goes on and on and on. Uh, repertoire that no one does: Beatrice di Tenda, I Capuletti di Montecchi, Norma, Lucrezia Borgia, like the Sutherland and Sills and Caballé repertoire that was done for prima donnas. She was able to resurrect, and it's like really the heir to that kind of role. I think so much so that she even started her own record company, Nightingale, in order to make <laughs> these recordings with her husband, Frieder, her that. second husband, Friedrich yeah. Heider. And there is some. I mean, she's had a lot of tragedy in her life i mean her daughter was in a terrible accident i forget when she was in vienna and um her first husband after the divorce commit suicide Mm. so um she's not without sadnesses in her life and plus you know the struggle of you know being living in communist czechoslovakia uh so much that you would how does somebody with that much hardship bring so much joy to people 
and the joy that the the joy that she finds in sharing music with others is so palpable through every recording that she made through every video of her that you watch and just by like completely and totally throwing herself into these characters on stage even though like no matter how melodramatic the situation no matter how much uh music snobs who like Wagner would want to poo poo on Lucrezia Borgia like you can tell <laughs> that she is embodying this music because she believes in it and because she believes in the yeah. choices and uh that it just like really comes through that I'm willing that that any quibbles that you could take with her voice or her singing or her interpretation like i it's all part and parcel with what makes her so special i don't think that you can really separate it out um and on top of that like there's just it it is very obvious through her singing that like the coloratura and the bravura is is expressive it's not just there for fireworks it's not just there so that she can be the person who sang the highest note the longest the fastest even though she also did do all those things like she it it is it's it's joyful and it is like very much in the spirit of these characters that she's trying to bring a lot. Well, exactly. Yeah. I'll also say it's because sometimes this music is so difficult that other singers are accomplished by just being able to sing it. But with Gubarova, nothing is too difficult for her, so she's always able to make expressive choices. Yeah. Good call. Bad call on Opera Box School. All right, good call, bad call. It's time to wrap this show up. Uh, let's start with Oliver. It's so great to hear that Michael Tilson Thomas has recovered from his brain surgery to remove mm. a tumor. And he, in fact, is already getting back on the podium later on this month with the San Francisco Symphony. And Matt Cummings. An almost as auspicious return is the return of Phantom of the Opera to the Broadway stage, uh, which was shepherded back alive by none other than Andrew Lloyd Webber himself. Uh, and the New York Times did like a really fun interview feature with him. I am obviously biased as someone who thinks that that show has like cycled around so much about being overrated that it's now kind of underrated. But we'll save that for another Hall of Fame. And uh, I, I, be I believe I did see also a TikTok of Andrew Lloyd Webber at the Phantom opening party, just like absolutely raving at the DJ stand, which I did enjoy very much. Move over, Skrillex. New York's <laughs> hottest club is Phantom. It has hey, everything. <laughs> Ashley Hardgrave. I have both a good and a bad call. We're going to start with the bad call, and that bad call is Norm Lebrecht. What I can say in two words, sir, is get bent. A few more, you only wish he had half the appeal of Yu Jia Wang. Period. End of sentence. And my good call is to our dear friend Weston Williams, who got engaged this weekend. Oh, yeah. I did. Yeah. Uh, to a woman. <laughs> yes, it's true. Not not I to me. <laughs> not, not to not to you. I did not for that, lack of that, trying. My bad call is that when I did post the engagement post, not a joke, I did accidentally tag Oliver Camacho in the photo with me, which was <laughs> unfortunate. Luckily, the engagement uh, okay. is still on despite I that. I think so, so. We now we now both work at WFMT, so our sort of mutual colleagues are like, oh, is that why Oliver wanted Weston to come on board? You know? <laughs> That is interesting. It for th interesting choice, Oliver, but sure, I, I can see it, you know. <laughs> That's it for this week's edition of America's Talk Radio Show about opera. Our announcer is Norm Waddell, who can be found at normwaddell.com. On Facebook, search for Opera Box Score. On Twitter and Instagram, we're at Opera Box Score. Help us deepen our bench of listeners by liking and sharing our social media posts. Email us your hot takes at operaboxscore at gmail.com. Drop us a line and get an OBS beer coaster and an OBS label pin just for sharing your own hot take. That's a great deal. Subscribe to our podcast on Stitcher or just favorite our show on Apple Podcasts. Our creative consultant is Oliver Camacho. Our audio and video editor is me. For your co-hosts, Matt Cummings and Ashley Hardgrave, I'm Weston Williams asking you to continue the conversation about opera as you learn all the extra notes of the 1912 version of Ariadne of Naxos. We're back with an all-new show next week where you'll get more opera headlines, more hot takes, more Donut Study Queens. Join us. <laughs>